Welcome to this course on Mind and Reality. I'm Steve Butterfield and I'll be your lecturer for this course. I haven't taught this course before, it's the first time for me, so it's particularly exciting. It's also for me the first time that I've taught an online lecture course. And weirdly enough, I'm incredibly nervous just as we're starting. So what I'm going to do is just dive straight into it, no messing about. This is fundamentally a course about the notion of a point of view, a point of view on the world. To illustrate, in the novel The Lost Memory of Skin, Russell Banks does something extraordinary. He creates empathy for a homeless paedophile called the kid. How does he do that? He allows you to understand the world, or something of it, from the kid's point of view. This is a feature of many novels, and of course plenty of fact books too, biographies for example. They allow you to understand things from another, perhaps quite alien, point of view. Why am I even mentioning this obvious truth? Well, you and I each have a point of view, and having a point of view is a fundamental part of having a mind like mine or yours. So thinking about points of view on the world seems to me like a good place to start in a course called Mind and Reality. So point of view, very simple. There are some things which are presented to you in a certain way. Having a point of view is just that. It's a matter of there being some things which are presented to you in a certain way. Terminology, though, can get pretty confusing. So as well as talking about points of view, I'll follow other people in talking about perspectives. But when I say perspective, I just mean a point of view. A perspective on the world is a point of view on the world. Another piece of terminology is this term intentionality. Now that's not a term I'm going to use very much, but you'll see it used quite widely in the textbooks. Intentionality is a feature of you, or of some states, or some other kind of part or aspect of you, in virtue of which you have a point of view. So when we're talking about intentionality, we're just talking about that in which... Sorry, say that again. When we're talking about intentionality, we're just talking about that in virtue of which you have a point of view. So this is a course, as I say, about points of view, about the idea that there are some things which are presented to you in a certain way. For me, those may be presented in a different way, or it may be that those things are not presented to me at all. Now, the notion of a point of view is going to turn out to be extremely puzzling. So it's helpful to think, at first, about a much simpler notion, the notion of a viewpoint. A viewpoint is just a location in space and a direction. I can occupy a viewpoint, and so can you. But, of course, you don't have to have a mind to occupy a viewpoint. A rock can also occupy a viewpoint. Now, this is tricky because, of course, rocks, unlike you and I, don't have fronts and backs, right? They don't have faces. Uh, but we could mark the front of a rock with some paint, or we could have assigned some function to the rock that gave it a front, like we do with cars and chairs and the rest. These are all fronted objects. Once we give the rock a front, there is a sense in which the rock is occupying a viewpoint and you might have to move the rock in order for you to occupy the viewpoint that previously the rock was occupying. So the notion of a viewpoint is an unmysterious notion. It's just a location and a direction. But it seems to be related to the idea of a point of view. So we might ask, is having a point of view just a matter of occupying a viewpoint? The idea that something with a mind might have a point of view is going to turn out to be extremely puzzling. That's what we'll see later in the course. By contrast, the idea that something occupies a viewpoint, that's not puzzling at all. Right? You can do that, I can do that, rocks can do that. Very simple. So if we could say that having a point of view was a matter of occupying a viewpoint, our lives of philosophers of mind would be much simpler. Just here, I want to turn this over to you. As I'm going to explain a little bit later, I hope that when you're doing these lectures, you're going to be observing them with a friend or perhaps several friends that you can communicate with. 
and I'm going to be at various points asking you questions and I'm going to give you 90 seconds to think about and ideally discuss those questions, come up with some answers or some complications. So here's the first 90 seconds. Is having a point of view just a matter of occupying a viewpoint? 90 seconds, go. So one of the things I'm really missing about live lectures is the opportunity just to hear what a few people are thinking on these questions. I hope that you're going to have some questions, some thoughts for the live online session about this. The question is, is having a point of view just a matter of occupying a viewpoint? I think we can see quite clearly that the answer is no by thinking about these basic features of a point of view. First of all, What's one of the things that's basic to a point of view is that it involves things being presented to you in a certain way. What looks hard to you might look soft to me. What looks like a mendacious, incompetent politician might look like a great leader to you. If having a point of view was just a matter of occupying a viewpoint, that would make no sense at all. After all, the viewpoint's just a location and a direction. There's no room in the notion of a viewpoint for the possibility that some things might appear one way to you, soft, another way to me, hard. So the fact that points, having points of view involves things being presented to you in a certain way already rules out the idea that we can think of having a point of view as just a matter of occupying a viewpoint. But there's something else. To understand your point of view, I may need to identify things which do not exist. Perhaps you mistakenly read The Lost Memory of Skin as a biography. So from your point of view, the kid is a person. You might try to go looking for him. You might try to find him. You might have some questions which are left unresolved by that novel. If I thought that having a point of view was just a matter of occupying a viewpoint, this would make no sense whatsoever. The kid is a fictional character. The, fit, the kid does not exist. There is no sense at all in which you can go looking for this person. Not a sensible thing to do. If I was just thinking in terms of viewpoints, matter of a location and a direction, I don't think I would be able to make sense of the idea that you have a point of view from which the kid is a real person. The reason why you are searching under those bridges going through the streets is because from your point of view, the kid is a historical character, not a fictional one. The notion of a viewpoint cannot in any way encompass things that do not exist. So it seems very clear. Having a point of view cannot just be a matter of occupying a viewpoint. It would make our lives much simpler if it could, but it looks like that's impossible. So this course, Mind and Reality, is a course about points of view. Having a point of view is a fundamental part of having a mind like your mind or my mind. We're going to be investigating 
a variety of philosophical questions, which were all in one way or another, questions about points of view. So let me start by telling you what those questions are. 